WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at University of Detroit Mercy. UDM's Master of Business Administration is designed to accommodate the career needs of professionals across a variety of work organizations. More information at business.udmercy.edu. Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham. And I'm Nick Austin. Today on the program, it's a kickoff for fireworks season tonight as the Detroit fireworks are going down. We'll talk to a fire prevention expert about the best way for you to enjoy your own fireworks displays as we head into the 4th of July later this hour. But first, it's new member Monday at WDET, and we've got something that will make your mouth water. Anyone who makes their first donation to WDET, that is first-time members, and becomes a new member at any point during the day will automatically uh, be entered in to a drawing to win a pair of VIP tickets to the Burger Battle. Tell us more about Burger Battle is Scott Rutterbush. Scott is the owner of Dine Drink Detroit, who puts on the Burger Battle in Eastern Market. Scott, welcome to the Metro. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so get into it. The simple as what is Burger Battle? So it is essentially a battle of burgers. Yeah. So we'll have up to 15 different chefs and restaurants participating, and they're competing for the trophy for best burger. And the guests get to come, try as many samples as they want. So the price of admission includes unlimited samples. So that's really the, the huge kind of feature is that you get to go around and try as many burgers as you possibly can. Very difficult to get all 15. I don't think anyone's ever done that before. That sounds like a challenge. It, yeah. <laughs> I think we get. I think we got some listeners out there who are going to take that we one For up, sure, for drive. sure, for sure. So how long has you guys been putting on Burger Battle? This is the eighth year. Eighth year. And talk about some of your favorites over those years. Yeah, we've had a lot of uh, really interesting burgers. Uh, one of the first winners was Tasty mm, Burger. Oh, I loved I just had Tasty's yeah. Burger this past weekend. Yeah, they have a great uh, burger with... Uh, uh, Dorito chips mm-hmm. on the burger, mm-hmm. you know, on the top is like a, an ingredient that was really unique and different. Uh, every year, somebody does something, you know, kind of crazy. Uh, Frida Batitas, which is in uh, Detroit and also originally in Ann Arbor, they won back to back years. That was uh, three or four years ago. They won two years in a row and they put a quail egg and french fries on their burger and they mm-hmm. did like a little slider. Mm. Um, that was really phenomenal. The, the fact that they were able to pull that off. And serve, I think they serve six, seven hundred of those uh, little sliders with the quail egg on it. So that's uh, really, it's really exciting to see, you know, who the winners are, what they do with their burger, what they put on it. Jalapeno was on one of the burgers that Cozy Lounge did, and they won, I think, three years ago they won. So, yeah, it's always a lot, it's always a lot of fun to see what they come up with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So how are contestants selected? How, how, how do we get the 15 uh, people who are going to be battling it out? Sure. It's usually like a lot of past attendees, uh, restaurants that have been in it before. But we always try to, you know, bring in new you know, restaurants. So it's invite only. We don't do like an open uh, post about signing up. But usually, you know, restaurants will find out about it through the media. And you will always after the after, you know, this weekend's event, we we'll usually get a couple of restaurants that call us. Oh, we wanted to be in it. Can we be in it next year? And, you know, we, we, we try to look at what the kind of burgers they have. And we want to obviously want to get the best of the best. Um, so it's, yeah, it's invite only. But, yeah, interesting restaurant. This year we're already booked up. But if people want to join next year or learn about it, they can, you know, reach out to us through the website burgerbattle.info. So I'm thinking about just we talked a little bit earlier, you were talking about social media and some of the uh, things that you're already seeing. Can you talk about how social media has helped uh, increase, I guess you can say, the creativity of burgers? Yeah. When we eat with our eyes, we talked about that, you know, off air and and the Instagram photos, you know, really make a huge difference in people wanting to come out. So we try to feature the burgers. A lot of times the restaurants will put a twist on whatever burger they're going to do, so they, so that way nobody knows exactly what they're doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, Instagram is a huge proponent of things like food because mm-hmm. of you know how it looks, how it presents. You see it, and you're like, oh, I got to get out there and try that burger. You mentioned that people or these restaurateurs don't want people to know exactly what you're doing. Are you telling me in this battle there's like some uh, some uh, espionage or people concerned that their secrets are going to be stolen? What have you seen here in the world of uh, the, the battle for burgers? Absolutely. You know, chefs a lot of times won't even bring the same burger back the second year. They want to they'll add a twist to it, do something different. They don't want anyone to, you know, copy it like, oh, that's a great idea that I'm going to do that. So. 
usually 90% of the restaurants will, it'll be a surprise. You know, they'll show up and that's when we find out what they're doing. And even when we will do interviews, sometimes we'll bring a chef, you know, on an interview like this, or if we're on TV doing a cooking demonstration before, they won't even cook that burger. They're going to cook something different because they want that element of surprise. Didn't bring us any burgers today. We want no, the burger. <laughs> Wait, there's no burgers? I'm sorry. This interview is over. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> So right now we're chatting with Scott Rudder Bush, the owner of Dine Drink Detroit, who puts on Burger Battle and Eastern Market. It's happening this Sunday. And if you are listening right now, you do enter in automatically entered in a drawing to win a pair of VIP tickets to the Burger Battle. This is for new members because it is new member Monday. I want to say thank you for for this opportunity for our listeners. So if you are not a member, you want to become a member, do so WDET.org slash give. You can do that right now. But for you, what's your favorite part about Burger Battle other than, of course, all of the scrumptious burgers? Yeah, I mean, the fact that you can try as many as you can eat and you get a chance to to uh, do that amongst 15, up to 15 different places, all in one, under one roof, which is, you know, really exciting. Um, I love that's in the Eastern Market. I'm a huge fan of the Eastern Market. Um, I think it's a perfect location. There's always great parking. Uh, the VIP aspect of it is huge. Um, as everyone knows, when they go to festivals and events, the thing that we hate the most about it is the lines. And right? in lines. Yes. And it's always difficult to not have any lines when you have an event that's going to have over 2,000 people. Um, but we created, um, years ago, we created this uh, VIP ticket. Um, and you get two hours. This year, you get two hours early entry. In the past, it's been one hour. Um, but we found that our, our guests wanted more time. So we made it two hours this year. So you get to enter at 11 a.m. as opposed to 1 p.m. So for two hours, which is a limited ticket, we limit the number of, of guests that can buy the VIP ticket. We're almost sold out. We have a few left, but we're really close to selling out of the VIP because it's the most popular because people don't want to wait in line. They come at 11, they get right in, and they get first access to all these chefs and they get to try the burgers. So. That's a VIP ticket. It's yeah. always a huge hit. All the more reason to be a part, become a member right now if yes. you haven't had an opportunity to. You'll be entered into that drawing again, WDET.org slash gift to become a new member, get a chance to get that VIP ticket. But Scott, you had mentioned a quail egg on a burger, for example. I've got to imagine with the course of the years, you've seen some wild stuff out there. Can you tell us the wildest burger that you've seen? The wildest burger that we've seen would probably... There was one that did uh, t- uh, two years ago. Naked Burger put uh, truffle, black truffle mm-hmm. on their on their burger, mm. and you know for the amount of burgers that you have to put mm. out for two thousand people, you know truffle's not not cheap. No, nope. and they did it. They pulled it off. They actually won the People's Choice um, that year for the most votes. They end up coming, I think, in second or third in the in the in the actual competition. But that blew me away that they were able to pull that off and 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 do the black truffle on the burger, and it was phenomenal. It was a really good burger. Yeah. So when I'm thinking about Scott, just this, this listening to what you're talking about right now, um, what is it like, especially to have this in Eastern Mark, but what is it like to, to bring the small businesses and restaurants there to, you know, to the forefront, to the public so that more eyes are on their, their restaurants and their businesses? Absolutely. I mean, everybody wants to win. It's highly competitive, um, it's a, but it's a friendly competition. And at the end of the day, all 15 restaurants uh, get exposure to over 2,000 people that all love burgers. I mean, nobody comes to this event that doesn't like burgers, right? It's a burger battle. So you're getting a targeted audience of, you know, 2,000 people that get a chance to try your burger, and then hopefully afterwards you're going to want to come and check out your restaurant. But the winners in particular get really inundated because there's a lot of media coverage after of who the winner is. So even if they don't go to the event, they'll see here's the top five, here's the winner, and last year's winner. So they had people driving up from Ohio, uh, weeks after the burger battle that they were coming up said so we saw it in the paper we saw on the news that you guys won the burger battle we had to come up and try your burger so he called us multiple times after and said that he just for for probably three months he had new people coming every day because they heard a year that they were the winner you know and that's that's happened to cozy lounge when they won and um chef max hardy uh when he won two years ago same thing uh, they were coming into his place and uh that's 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 rewarding for us, you yeah. know, putting on the event to see these small businesses um, get rewarded for producing a, f- a phenomenal product, and the, the the guests come out and they support. Um, so that's always exciting to see that. That's one of the reasons I know what Tasty's is. I, I mean, I just I, I read it somewhere, yeah. I read about them winning, and I said, oh, this is interesting. It's not too far from so. Went there years ago, of course. Now and uh, been a fan ever since. So oh, yes, great. yes, word to mouth. That's. 
yes, it's yes. been working. Absolutely. So um, just uh, once again, just just th- thinking about burgers, thinking about small businesses, thinking about just everything. How does the voting work and what do the winners receive? Absolutely. So the, the guests get a chance to vote for their top three burgers. And if you get a, a first place vote from a guest, you get three points. If you get a second place vote, you get two points. If you get a third place vote, you get one point. So you get a chance to, to vote for three of your favorites. And then we add up the score at the end and the top five vote getters get to go in front of the judges to present their burger. And so we kind of stop the competition at the end and say, okay, we've now we're announcing the top five. And then we allow each uh, place to cook their burgers for one for each judge. We'll have five judges and they're mm. from the free press from CBS, uh, from uh, Metro time. So we always get like food editors and, and media, uh, we we'll have a we have a chef Devante who won uh, Chopped last yeah, season. Yeah. He's one of the yeah. judges this year. So we have a steam group of judges that will then score the burgers, and the, whoever gets the highest score re- receives a, a huge trophy. Uh, they get to take back to the restaurant with them. So we have a new trophy every year, and they get to keep that trophy forever, put it up at their restaurant, and display it, you know, proudly. And they also receive a thousand dollar check mm. as well. So there's a presentation at the end. We give them a big check for a thousand dollars. We give them a huge trophy to take back to the restaurant and then, you know, massive, uh, you know, pride. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. But before we do let you go, Chef Max Hardy. So there is going to be a special booth, a special presentation for it. Chef Max Hardy, if you want to get into that. Absolutely. Um, it's pretty personal for me. He was one of my best friends and we hung out a lot. Uh, he won two years ago and then I knew it was coming. People would say, oh, he was, you know. You had a part in him winning, and I'm like, nope, I don't cast a vote. I have no vote in the competition. Um, I was, it was exciting for him to win. At the end, we always give the winner also a bottle of champagne. And as I'm announcing, he literally shook it up. <laughs> opened, I turned around. He opened it up as I turned around, and uh, our photographer actually got a shot of it. I have a picture. It's on my in my Instagram that uh, of that happening. Uh, it was a really special moment. Just uh, wanted to see him win because he had come in the top five three years in a row before oh. that. He come in second one year. He come in third one year. He's like, man, I'm gonna win. I'm gonna win. I'm gonna win this year. And he, you know, he did it. So, but yeah, unfortunately, um, he passed away um, this past March. Lost a huge loss to the culinary community in Detroit. But uh, what a special individual. And this year we're gonna have a booth, um, Chef Phil Jones, and um, uh, fried chicken and caviar. Nick um, are gonna are gonna produce a burger in his honor. And uh, we're really excited to to just you know to, to give back and and show what a special person he was and what he meant to to Detroit. Yeah, yeah. Scott Rutterbush is the owner of Dine Drink Detroit, who puts on Burger Battle in Eastern Market. Thank you so much for joining us on New Member Monday. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And today we have a special offer for those who have never donated to WDET. You can join Team DET today and we'll enter you in to a drawing to win VIP tickets to the Detroit Burger Battle. Make your gift before midnight tonight and you'll have a good chance of spending this Sunday eating as many burgers as you can handle and skipping the lines with your VIP tickets, which open you up to the to the burgers at 11 a.m. Visit WDET.org slash give and join Team DET right now. This drawing once again is only for new members now you don't have to enter to win but we hope you will and looking forward to that always great to eat some burgers detroit known for having great burgers but detroit is getting a lot of love nationally if you're listening now you already know what we're all about but nationwide folks are starting to pay attention to what's happening here in the city when we return we'll hear an npr story from our own don gagne about the fascination the nation has with detroit when we return WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at the University of Detroit Mercy. UDM is offering a new Master of Science degree in ethical leadership focused on sustainable, ethical, and inclusive problem solving. Admission is open to qualified applicants with a bachelor's degree in any field. Course selection is flexible with no prerequisites, four required courses, and six electives. Learn more at business.udmercy.edu. I'm Rachel Martin. You probably know how interview podcasts with famous people usually go. There's a host, a guest, and a light Q&A. But on Wildcard, we have ripped up the typical script. 
It's a new podcast from NPR where I invite actors, artists, and comedians to play a game using a special deck of cards to talk about some of life's biggest questions. Listen to Wild Card wherever you get your podcasts, only from NPR. Welcome back to the Metro on 1019 WDETFM, and it is New Member Monday. That's right. For as little as $5 or $5 a month, you can be entered into a drawing to win VIB tickets to that Detroit burger battle you just heard about. Not only do you get to support local public radio, you get an opportunity to maybe experience so many great, wonderful local burgers. All you need to do is make that donation before midnight tonight for New Member Monday at WDET.org slash give. So thank you so much for becoming a part of that, becoming a part of what we're doing here on the Metro featuring Detroit, which has had a great year so far. Think back. The NFL draft was such a success, Tia. Michigan Central reopened with that star-studded concert that was streamed live on Peacock. And importantly, the city's population went up for the first time in decades. NPR's Don Gagne, good friend of us here at the station, has been out and about in the city this year and has the story of some of the welcome good news we've all been experiencing here in the city. We start at the Michigan Central Station. This is the city's classic old train station. It was a landmark to be proud of until it became a frightening ruin in recent decades. A towering edifice, a gateway for many thousands of new residents coming from the south as part of the Great Migration and just people from all over hoping for work on Detroit assembly lines. And when train travel declined, such a building was no longer needed. Closed and padlocked, a long and depressing decline began. Until this month, when it reopened to the public. Newly restored, looking like new. Last week I stepped inside. It was a return for me. I was here the day the last train pulled away in January of 1988, January 5th. And um, I I am getting emotional standing here in this space. Uh, It didn't look this great even then, even though it was still a functioning station. It's been rescued thanks mostly to a billion-dollar investment by the Ford Motor Company. The automaker will fill it with engineers and others working to develop cars of the future, including next-generation electric vehicles, There'll be startup businesses as well, and restaurants, shops, even events like weddings. Standing inside the now gleaming Grand Concourse, in the midst of several thousand other visitors who were walking around awestruck, we spoke to Michigan Central CEO Josh Syrofman, who will oversee the revived facility. You know, originally this was the waiting area, and for us now, you know, you see we're, we're already starting to tell stories in here. That day when the last train pulled away, I talked to a woman on one of those benches and seated there all by herself, kind of alone with her thoughts. And I went up to her and asked her if I could talk to her. And she told me she hadn't been in the station since 1944. World War II, she sent her fiancé off. He went off to war. Yeah. He did not come home. And didn't come home. It's much more than a train station. I mean, it's literally, it's where everybody has some important life moment that has connected them to this building. And the emotion and the stories are just so moving. Now to the next piece of big news Detroit has been talking about. Its population has grown. It's the first such increase for the city since the 1950s. It's a morale booster, certainly, even though the increase seems tiny, just 1,852 people. But it's also a very big deal, according to Kurt Metzger, a former Detroit-based analyst for the U.S. Census Bureau. This region hasn't grown in 70 years It's not just Detroit, it's the entire region. Detroit's population peaked at 1.8 million. Every census report since has shown that number shrinking, plummeting 
to less than 700,000. White flight was a major part of it. People headed to suburbs, businesses too. Factories closed as new ones opened far outside the city. But now, a population increase. Kurt Metzger couldn't wait to tell the mayor's office. When I saw that number, I was ecstatic. (laughs) Even growing by such a small amount, he says, is significant. It marks the end of a long, long losing streak. It's that perception, right? And perception, as we have found in politics, is reality. For our last stop, we switch to sports. In Detroit, that's always meant the Tigers, Lions, Pistons, or Red Wings. This has always been a place deeply into its sports teams. But now let's add soccer to that list. The Detroit City Football Club has been around for a dozen years and plays in the United States Soccer League. That's a notch below Major League Soccer. The team has a growing and intense fan base. Our producer, Elena Torek, checked it out on a recent Saturday. She caught up with Kate Fasco on the way to the match. We're seeing people come um, that we've never seen before. Ages, you know, ethnicities, gender, sexuality. Our goal is to be as welcoming of a place as we can be for everybody. Outside the stadium, food trucks are everywhere. This one sells every kind of pierogi imaginable. Potato farmer's cheese, plain potato, sweet farmer's cheese, potato cheddar cheese. Potato Currently, the club plays at Keyworth Stadium. With a capacity under 8,000, it's in the Detroit enclave of Hamtram. But last month came the announcement that it'll move to a brand new, larger stadium to be built in Detroit's historic Corktown neighborhood. Mark Navarro is a member of the team's leading fan club. As far as the club goes and the crowd goes, obviously it's gotten a lot bigger. (laughs) Thinking about the days when we would sell out tiny little Castec Stadium, and now we're here, you know, selling out Keyworth Stadium, which is much larger, and moving to a much larger stadium in a couple years that will hopefully continue selling out as well. The new facility will be built on the site of a long-abandoned old hospital, and it'll be close to the renovated Michigan Central Station. Brian Perrone owns Slow's Barbecue, which set up shop in Corktown more than 20 years ago. He recalls what it was like back then. There wasn't a lot. Tumbleweeds, really. Today, the Slow's Barbecue block is busy and about to get a lot busier. Down the street, Jennifer Crawford Williams is showing off her Corktown neighborhood business. Everything comes from a different brand, so Ink Detroit, Detroit made. It's called All Things Marketplace. She sells Michigan made products with room to host events in back. But as Detroit sees growth, Crawford Williams cautions that it needs to keep its identity. That gentrification is not the answer. Across the board growth is. She's working to be part of that. I know Corktown talks a lot about being diverse, but to me, I want to see it more. I want to see more black-owned businesses or minority-owned businesses popping up here because it's something that's needed. It's Detroit, right? We'll close our mini tour of Detroit, acknowledging again that this is obviously just a piece of the city's full story. Big, big challenges remain. But the summer arrives on a high note, and Detroiters hope it's not just a blip, but maybe a real sign of more things to come for the entire city. That was NPR's Don Gagne reflecting on all of the great experiences we've been having so far here in Detroit. As you're listening to the Metro on 101.9 WDET, Tia, I don't know if you have like a favorite thing that's gone down in all of these events or anything, but what are your thoughts, especially after hearing that piece? You know, number one, just love being from the city of Detroit, Um, love being a Detroiter. And I just love when it gets warm in the city of Detroit and we are we have the opportunity to have events like Michigan Central Station, you know, just having spaces like that to walk around and seeing these spaces opening up. It's just been really, really nice to see the 
the positive changes that we've been seeing in certain areas. So. I ran into last night when I was just hanging out, doing the thing, listening to music out here, uh, a couple um, of friends who had lived in Chicago for a while. And one person who was from Chicago had come back to Detroit and was showing around a friend who was a native of Detroit, but had lived in Chicago for like the past decade, who hadn't seen all of these things that are happening. And she just mentioned to me, she was like, yeah, Detroit's getting after it. We all know that. We so all know, because Detroit hustles harder. We, no, we didn't leave. We never left. Yeah. You know, and, you know, summer is here. It is the summertime. The smell of fresh cut grasses in the air gives me allergies, but some people like it. Flowers are blooming, and if you listen closely, you'll hear this. Oh. That was, a sound, that was a song of a robin, Michigan State bird. It's one of the many birds you can hear and see this summer in Michigan. And helping these tiny creatures is the Michigan Bird Center in Saleem. They care for and rehabilitate about 250 native songbirds every summer. WDET's Jack Philbrandt spoke with clinic manager Marissa Jardine to learn how humans can help and better cohabitate with our feathered friends. What's kind of like the best protocol or your recommendations for people if they do encounter a hurt or injured bird species in the wild? Yeah, so a lot of people will, like you kind of mentioned, try and care for them themselves. And it all comes from good intentions, right? But really the best thing is to bring it to a licensed wildlife rehabber where they go through um, training, certifications, and licensing that's required to have these migratory birds. So if you were to ever find an injured or orphan bird, the best thing to do is first place them in a box without any food or water um, and contact a licensed rehabber, whether it's us, if we're closest to you or someone else, we'll be able to guide you on the best next steps. Um, not offering any food or water may be tempting to do so. Google will often tell you to do it, but don't listen to Google. We know that it doesn't always tell you the right thing, right? So just always call a licensed rehabber. Are there like common injuries that you're seeing when it comes to birds coming into the facility? So the most common cause of injury on our birds are unfortunately either directly or indirectly caused by humans and the impact we've had. So most commonly we'll get window collisions, which usually they come in displaying signs of like concussions and head trauma, neurological symptoms. And a lot of the times with these cases, people will call us thinking, oh, should we just wait it off, see if they fly away? And that's a huge misconception with head injured birds. You never want to wait to see if they kind of shake it off and fly away. We might, you know, be walking around okay after we just sustained a concussion, but that doesn't mean we don't need monitoring or any assistance. The thing is with a lot of these birds that you're finding that are head injured, they have that fight or flight response. So because they they are at risk of possibly getting eaten, they're gonna try and fly away. They got that burst of adrenaline, they're using that energy to get away from you, but they often later succumb to their injuries. A recent study within the past five years um, at a wildlife rehab center somewhere in the Midwest found that over 90% of their head trauma cases had signs of brain bleeding. Um, so it's just super imperative that you bring them into rehabilitation. They can get examined, pain medications, oxygen therapy, and be fully assessed to that extent of the head trauma. What are some things that we as humans can do to better cohabitate with birds and prevent them from ending up at the bird center? I would say the two most important things you can do, and this is based directly off what we see at the center, which are window collisions and cat caught birds, is applying window deterrents to your windows if they reflect nature and the outdoors. Birds don't understand windows. So having those deterrents are gonna help them recognize that distinction and prevent those collisions. And then if you have a cat, we love them so much, we love cats. Cats, but please, please keep them indoors. They cause a lot of detriment to native wildlife, and that's not including just birds. That was WDET's Jack Philbrandt talking to Marissa Jardine. She's the clinic manager at the Michigan Bird Center. While it's never a good idea to take in any wild creatures, the bird, the Michigan Bird Center warns against adopting ducklings. They're very cute, but they're also very social and can pick up some human traits. This makes their chances of returning to the wild almost impossible. So I know it's fun. I know it's cute. Leave the duckies alone. I love that ducks are becoming humans out here, man. I remember this movie called Howard the duck it was terrible uh you don't want your ducks taking on human characteristics so i appreciate that safety note thank you there jack phil brand producer with the metro tia we're hearing a lot about the birds some people would tell you that uh this segment was for the birds do you have a favorite bird you keep saying the birds the birds the birds i'm thinking of albert hitchcock mm -hmm. the birds you're scaring me classic you're scaring me
You know, the Robin is nice. I don't know if it's just because I'm a big fan of Batman and Robin, Michigan State Bird. So I'll go with it. But I love a good bluebird. I was going to say, I love a good look. bluebird, a jaybird. Like, they're just so, you know, mm-hmm. every time I see one, I'm just like, oh, something's speaking to me. Right on. Well, what we got coming up next here? Right now, actually, or oh, coming up on. next, <laughs> coming up next on the Metro, we have the Obsidian Theater. They're going to be here chatting about the fourth annual Obsidian Theater Festival, along with a new conference that's happening right now. You all stay there for the Metro. It's the Metro on 101.9 WDET, where it's new member Monday, not only right now, but all day here at WDET. What does that mean? For as little as $5 a month, you could be entered into a drawing to win VIP tickets to Detroit Burger Battle merely by becoming one of our new members, supporting your local public radio station, and even get an opportunity to enjoy some burgers. All you got to do is make a donation before midnight tonight at WDET.org slash give and you'll automatically be entered to win. But Tia. You know, I think about burgers and I just think about grazing. That's one of my favorite things that I love about that is like just going around grazing to the different burger spots. But, you, uh, know, you know, those old burgers that you eat used to be doing that grazing. So there is a little bit of a connection there. I won't even hold you up. That was good. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> a little grazing in the grass right now like the Friends of Distinction. <laughs> Exactly. We didn't went too far, Nick. Sorry. The art form I'll that is <laughs> the art form that is theater spans back before the days of Shakespeare. It never escapes us. It's human to want to see and hear and tell stories. And this generation and this city are no different, using its community, culture, and resources to tell the stories that reflect us. This year, the Obsidian Theater is celebrating its fourth annual Obsidian Theater Festival. The fest will take place over three locations, three different locations throughout downtown Detroit. And the festival follows Ghost Light Arts and its initiative's inaugural three-day Detroit Impact Arts Conference, which is happening right now. The conference begins today and goes on through Wednesday, June 26th, and it's happening at Wayne State's Student Center. Performances for the fourth annual Obsidian Theater Festival begin Thursday, and they end on Sunday, June 30th. To continue the conversation about this year's festival and conference, we have Garlia Jones. Garlia is a playwright, a folk, a photographer, an Obie Award-winning theater producer, and a creative producer for Obsidian Theater. Thank you so much for being here in studio with us. You're welcome. I'm I am thrilled to be here. It's always fun to be back in the studio. So, <laughs> four years in. Uh, four years in. You ramped yeah. up big time this year. Talk about this year. Let's just talk about the uh, the festival first. This mm-hmm. is going to be starting this Thursday mm-hmm. through Sunday. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I mean, I, I, this this year we we have really grown, right? So the the festival starts Thursday, but as you mentioned, happening right now, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We also have some additional free programming. We have the an. an not inaugural Detroit Impact Arts conference, as you said, and it is actually happening at the McGregor Memorial Conference Center on the on the Wayne State McGregor uh, okay campus. And so during these three days, we have youth programming in the morning. So we have a, a young artist playwriting workshop that's being led by. And Eskridge, um, if 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 you know the 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 Detroit, if you know the Detroit play playwright scene, then you know Anne and, and the work that 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 she 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 does. We also have the audition prep work 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 workshop. So that's that's happening right right now, and that's being led by John but John Sloan the third, who is our founder our producing our artistic director and the e and the ed of the ghost light arts initiative so that's that that is all 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 happening right right now and we've got young people who are who have access to artists like john and and broadway stars who who are who who are now native to did traders like lulu 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 
Ball, who, who's also um, do, doing that workshop with, I had with no idea. yeah, yeah. So I mean, it is a big, 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 big week, and that's just the first half of the day. So starting at one o'clock, one o'clock every day, we have two to three war workshops, uh, pan, panels, or screen, screen, screen. Screen screenings that take a look back over the last four years, actually, actually, actually three, three years of 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 the festival. So we 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 have artists who have been in the in the festival. We have former staff and artistic leaders of the festival festival who are all 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 here, and we have um, groups of of Detroit playwrights telling their stories. And then this 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 afternoon we will have our geeky Ukrainian note speaker, which is Detroit own Dom Dominique Moore Moore so who goes without really any inter- any introduction right. whatsoever. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just think about some of the things you just said and yes. the people that you all or people have access to in, with this conference, especially Absolutely. the young people, because mm-hmm. the young people are the future. And that's what the impact, the Detroit Impact Arts Conference really is. It's about yes. the young people exactly. and building that community. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, just thinking about some of the things that you were just talking about. In what ways will we see this conference, uh, uh, or in what ways do you see this conference impacting young people going forward? I mean, arts programming is all about access, right? And so this gives students the start of some train, some train, some some train, 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 training, and the beginning beginning of some tech technique if if they if they have not been ex- exposed to it before and f- and f- and f- and for those who who have it is just a chance to be around more like-minded students right i mean i re- i remember being a young young student really involved in 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 theater and so you look for the other kids who like theater too right and so this is a chance for um for the students or predominantly students of 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 of, of color to to be in that that space and learn 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 Learn, learn from people that they can look up to, right? Yeah. And, you yeah. know, I, I just think about some of the young kids, even myself. We didn't have theater in high school or middle yeah. school. So there right. was little to no access exactly. to this creative outlet. Mm-hmm. Maybe you didn't know you could write or maybe you didn't exactly. know you could even act. Right. So to have something like this, a pathway, just to get your just feet wet. Just to get stuff started, yeah. right? Because, because all you need is that one little start. And then you go, oh, I can write this play. And then you can as- assemble your friends and begin to tell these stories, right? And stories of your experience, right? I think that that's something that um, the Obsidian Theater Festival is really about. We are, our 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 hashtag is Black Black Stories New Stage, and you know, just just personally, I have been devoted to telling Black stories for like twenty plus. Yeah, 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 years, and so this f- festival is about black stories, right? And so for young people to be around people who are f- focused on black stories, John, John, I mean, we, if 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 you have met John, if you have spoke to John, you know he is singularly focused on on this, on the on the growth of the Ghost Light Arts uh, Initiative, right? And and just to note that the 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 city and theater festival is one of the pro one of the bigger pro programs of the Ghost Arts Initiative. But this 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 conference that we have begins to roll out different pieces of of that. Right. So we have the neighborhood engagement program series, which is part of the Oka Oka conference and so you will see if you go to our our web website you'll see all the different um the the different sessions that that we have and so there's a couple different tracks there's the the NEPs which is the neighborhood engagement pr- pr- 
program series, and there's the Propulsion Theater Project track, which I co-direct with um, John. So I'm super excited because I know we have so much to get into. We had so much to get into, but so much. We ran out of time here. However, I'm going to get into the important parts of the the conference. So registration for the inaugural conference is available at yes. ghostlight.art/impact. Yes. And those performances for the fourth annual Obsidian Theater Festival begin this Thursday, June 27th, and they end on Sunday, June 30th. This is in an effort to continue to be accessible to all those. They will also be streaming August mm-hmm. of 2024. Yeah. So. Yeah. Super excited about that. Garlia is, Garlia Jones, excuse me, is a playwright, <laughs> photographer, Obie Award winning theater producer. Garlia is also the creative producer for Obsidian Theater. Thank you so much for joining us on the Metro. Good luck with the conference. Good luck with the, the festival this year. And can't wait to hear how it went. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's the Metro on 101.9 WDET. Little good news for you. Gasoline prices have dropped six cents a gallon since last Monday. AAA says Michigan drivers are paying an average of $3.51 for the cheapest grade of gas this morning. Maybe now is the time for you to fill up, especially if you're planning on getting downtown for those fireworks. Why? Because the Detroit fireworks are tonight. And whether you're going down or want to have your own personal dis- displays at home, right? This is the kickoff of fireworks season. But what is the best way to enjoy fireworks at home safely? If you're putting them off yourself, we'll talk with a fire prevention specialist about the safest ways to enjoy your own fireworks party when we return on the Metro. Welcome back to the Metro here on 101.9 WDETFM, and it is a Monday, which means it's new member Monday at WDET. And if you've never donated to WDET before, become a member right now. You can do it right now. Visit WDET.org slash give now and your donation comes with entry in a drawing to win two VIP tickets to this weekend's burger battle at Eastern Market. Definitely sounds like a win for me. Yeah. Who doesn't love an opportunity to not only get some burgers, but you get to skip the line if you're the winner and uh, provide that gift of support for the station that you love listening to. We know you love listening to it because you're listening right now. But also, besides win wins, right? Another win happening tonight is the Detroit Fireworks, the 66th annual event. Traditionally, one of the largest displays in the world is set to take place, should be jumping off around 10 p.m., and the free public event will include viewing locations at Hart Plaza, Bell Isle, and Spirit Plaza. But even if you can't make it downtown, you can check out the action at home via Channel 4. Now, while the uh, fireworks, uh, personal fireworks, are not allowed anywhere in the location, you can't go down there bring your own personal Why? fireworks popping off. <laughs> Probably because of the uh, safety of the crowd, especially if you don't know the proper ways of uh, fire them off. You can do it at home, but there are some things that you can do to make sure your personal displays are a little bit safer. But what are the best ways to do it to you, especially considering the heat wave? that we've been going through recently. To learn more, we're joined by Paul Rogers, a fire prevention specialist for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Paul, welcome to the Metro. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah, happy to have you here because last year, I know a lot of places, cities uh, canceled firework shows due to the extremely dry conditions. So leading into this year, is that something that you we're looking at and worried about this year? Or what's the weather saying in terms of our fireworks uh, displays this year? Well, this year we're feeling far more comfortable going into the fourth than we were last year. Um, we were in an unprecedented drought last year, um, as most people know, because our lawns were all dead and dried up by now already. So um, it, it is a much better year. Um, we're looking forward to it. Everything um, we, we're looking out, we're still seeing continuing rainfall over the next three to four days, which will lead into July 4th. So even though we had a lot of heat, there was also a lot of humidity. So 
Um, a lot of the grass is still green, and that will really help us. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because heat and humidity, you're more worried about, I guess, humidity when it comes to fireworks, safety. But with the heat wave uh, that's happening, even with humidity, does that have any effects on fireworks, or is that something that we can feel okay about? Um, we're still seeing some. We actually, um, I live over on the west side of the state, and we actually had some hayfield fires last week. Mm. So with that drought, it is drying out the grass enough that you didn't even – uh, half of my yard is actually very brown. So we are starting to see the drought kick back in again. We're not, it normally happens starting from now until Labor Day. We see it. Um, so it is, it is still a factor and you just need to keep mindful of that because it only takes, you know, after a good rain and now that we're in full green up, it only takes three to four days for things to start to turn brown and really dry out again. Yeah. Paul, you wouldn't like me to admit this to you, and I wasn't one of the folks doing this, but I remember growing up people taking bottle rockets, firing them at each other, for example, your sparklers, mm-hmm. lots of things with fireworks, probably not the most safe thing to do. 80s For you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is, is that obvious? Yeah. What is the most misunderstood rule or state regulation we have around fire? fireworks that you run into yeah as, as the dnr we don't actually regulate the fireworks rules but one question we do get asked is you know people think that because michigan passed a new fireworks law they can you know shoot off these big fireworks anytime they want and really you can't the designated times are the day before the holiday the day of the holiday and the day after Ooh. and so we you know ask people please be kind to your neighbors and Make sure they're allowed by your local community, number one. But, you know, be kind and use them around the fourth as, as they should. So, and then, of course, keeping everything safe in mind and making sure, especially one of the big things, is making sure there's adult supervision nearby um, so they can keep a watch on the kids. Um, and then the big thing we res- that we request is being the DNR is, you know, the wildfire scenarios and fires. It doesn't have to be the big ones you see out west which michigan has big ones too uh, but it's any grass lighting on fire so try not to shoot them into the woods we've had them before where you know people were shooting them off into the woods and then three days later they just sit in there and just kind of smolder and then they start to burn and then we get called in so um, we do get several of those every year it happens so you know shoot them into a vacant lot or somewhere where you know that they're not going to catch the grass on fire and take off. And we always stress, make sure you have water nearby. Mm. Have a garden hose not laying there, but out and have it hooked up with a nozzle with the water turned on. I mean, that delay can let a fire grow in a significant amount of time if you're trying to find the hose and hook it up and make sure you have water and even have a bucket nearby. Um, It's one of the the big things we always stress to people. Yeah, preparation is important. It is also good to hear from you the day of the fireworks before, after, I'm sorry, July 4th, the day before, the day after. Those are the designated times. So thanks for sharing that. As Again, we're speaking with Paul uh, Rogers, who is a fire prevention uh, safety expert or specialist with the DNR. Paul, uh, we got like about a minute left. What are the biggest risks that you see or find people ignore when it comes to fireworks so that we can just uh, get around some of those issues? Um, Some of the things I've heard in the past is when you're going around and picking them up, make sure you just don't put them into a bucket or a pail or throw them in your trash. Have a bucket that's half filled with water and throw them into that if you're going around and picking them up to make sure they're out. Um, And if one does not go off, like say you light the fuse and it goes up into it and nothing happens, let it sit there for a while. Do not immediately grab it and either try to relight it or try something else. Let it sit there for five, ten minutes if it does not go off then stick it in a bucket of water. You never know what's going on up inside. It might be a little bit of moisture or something in there, and it takes a few more minutes for it to take off. So be extremely careful with that. And then, of course, all the normal campfire safety things of always having a bucket or a hand tool like a rake or a shovel nearby to help put stuff out. Mm, Rake or shovel nearby. All right, now I have the 30 seconds. What is that? Is like smothering something I hear? Because I would be concerned about whatever I put on top of that maybe igniting something or I wouldn't be able to see it. So what's the recommendation if you have like a you mentioned the dud lane out there? What do I use the rake for? Well, the rake and the shovel, you can, if you have a dud and you don't want to pick it up, you can use the rake and pull the dead grass away from it. Mm. So if it does start and take off, it doesn't light the grass on fire and the grass is gone. Just stay away from it, like two feet around it, and pull everything away from it. Yeah. If, a, yeah. if a fire does start, you can take some sand with a shovel and just throw the sand on it to help put the, the fire out. 
Paul Rogers, fire prevention specialist for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Thank you so much for joining us on the Metro. You're very welcome. Thank you. This is the Metro for June 24th. You can listen to recent episodes online at WDET.org and make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. The show is produced by Sam Corey, David Lines, and Jack Philbrandt. Additional production support from Anel Scott and Sydney Walkley. Our engineer is Nate Bender, and the music is provided by Sam Bobian and Will Sessions. The Metro is a production of WDET, a listener-supported service of Wayne State University. If you like what you hear and want to support the Metro, consider becoming a member at WDET.org slash donate. This is WDET-FM, Detroit Public Radio, your connection to news, music, and conversation. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow. WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at University of Detroit Mercy. UDM is offering a new master's degree in ethical leadership focused on sustainable, ethical, and inclusive problem solving. More information at business.udmercy.edu.